Hey there, and welcome to our roundtable discussion discussion on what's your style, finding your style, do you have a voice or signature, when does it happen, when do you say, oh, now I have a style, we're going to explore all those things, and I have a panel here of four guests and myself, and each one of the guests here I've known for a long time, more than a couple of years, and I've watched their unique photographic voice develop over the course of time. And so I'm going to start uh, just by opening this up. I'm going to go to gallery view in uh, Zoom here. And we're just going to just really quickly talk about kind of what we think that is. And then I'm going to start and we're each going to have a chance to highlight a few images of before and after, like where we started, where we are now, and what kind of led us to that style. We're going to keep it pretty high level because a discussion like this could literally go on for two or three hours. And um, I'd like to condense it so that we cover the high points and make it meaningful for you to watch. And then perhaps in comments on this video in the communities I run or on YouTube, you can, you can let us know maybe what happened in your journey. What, what's the one thing, and this is the question at the end, what's the one thing that made the biggest difference to you developing a style, even if it's not finished yet. There, so now we're a gallery of people. So I'm just going to introduce Richard, Bessa, John, and Amanda. And they're all currently students of mine in Mentorship Plus. And we, we have a great time submitting images, applying ourselves to goals, and leveling up our skills. And so each one of them, we're going to have a chance to uh, introduce independently. But just as a discussion point, just throw your hand up and uh, on your journey, um, I'm going to ask this question. How important has finding inspiration through a mentor or a teacher or just a person that you happen to follow online? How instrumental has that been to maturing as a photographer? And Just throw your hand up and I'll pick on you. Yeah, Richard, go ahead. Don't forget to unmute. Well, um, I think it's really tremendously important to get a mentor. And um, just for clarification and, and start bouncing off and the cohort or um, uh, having a, a safe group where you can put some images in is very important also. Yeah, that's a good point. Having somewhere to submit your images. I think a lot of us can agree, generally speaking, that um, the internet, the ability to share images has had a great impact on our ability to get instant feedback. And although we don't always do it just for likes, it's nice to see a, an image be popular or to get really positive reinforcement. Uh, anyone else, John, what do you think about that, this conversation? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, my background before this was in recruiting for almost 30 years. And the best people, executives I ever met, I'd always ask them, who were your mentors? And they would always go back. And it related to a specific aspect of their development that they chose and found a mentor. Um, and and I, I think we as photographers, especially this group growing up in the Arcanum, and uh, further on, have found multiple mentors. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's great because it teaches us different things. Uh, and we see a different viewpoint. And um, so it's, I think, a, a, an incredibly important thing. Yeah. Yeah, good points. Um, for those that don't know, the Arcanum was an education platform built on the Master Apprentice Framework, where uh, an, an experienced photography mentor would take on a cohort of uh, so many, up, up to 20 or so uh, photographers, and, and level them up on a leveling guide. Very similar to what we do in Mentorship Plus, but we focus less on a leveling guide and more on community in Mentorship Plus. Amanda, what do you, what do you think? What are your thoughts on this? topic here i think it's been great having someone to like really ping questions off especially when it comes down to like editing and 
I know lately I've been doing a lot of art shows, so being able to talk to someone about those of the pros and cons and how to go about like submitting stuff as well. Yeah. How do you feel about like you do shows like live shows? Um, how do you feel about the difference between in-person discussions about your work and what happens online? Do you have a preference? Or are they different? What about that? I actually like the in-person stuff all, 10 times better. Um, I can vouch for the last couple of years where I've done virtual shows where it's been 100% online versus the in-person ones. And especially with my stuff, folks always have a ton of questions and I can be able to talk to them in person versus I don't get that same interaction with yeah. like a virtual show because yeah. they'll have to either email me, DM me on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever social, other social media I have um, versus, hey, I'm right there. And they can ask specific questions about one photo over another you know while they're looking through stuff so it's a lot yeah. easier for me that way yeah I, I i have enjoyed when i've had my work in live shows where a discussion can happen and if you're selling work that's the best forum to sell it because you can really add stories to your images in in real life and so that's a, a good point vessa welcome how are you doing i'm going to spotlight you there thank you yeah yeah, I think what I, I could say is we we're actually talking with Richard before the recording that uh, really I, through this type of uh, community, I learned to give and receive feedback. And it's very important to for your own growth. I mean, uh, that you get get feedback and, and critiques and, and, and learn how to take it uh, and yeah. also that you give feedback that's kind of gives other people opportunities to expand their work. Uh, so uh, very valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Critique. We do uh, critique. We don't do as much in the new platform. I'd like to do more. I'm going to find a way to do more, um, but just going to, to chat here. Put me back on spotlight. Um, I think, Critique is really important. And by critique, I mean good feedback, both by experts and by peers. Like you don't, you don't have to be way up here to give good feedback or critique. Because I think critique, good critique, um, allows encouraging commentary about what works and ideas about what might be improved. And if you frame it that way, critique is not a bad word. It's not intimidating. And it helps us all grow. I find a lot of people are really afraid to submit the work. It's like rip your heart open and put your work in front of the world. And um, I prefer to critique in probably a little bit more gentle but honest way. I'm never dishonest, but um, uh, by identifying what's working and areas for improvement. Critique has been been so valuable for the journeys of all the people that I know that have grown substantially, sometimes over a very short period of time. I'm going to move over to a screen share. I'm going to uh, show you a little bit about my beginnings. Most people have never seen, ever seen these works. Uh, and uh, so I'm just going to show them to you um, quickly. And uh, then we're going to move along uh, and do it that way. So let me do a screen share. I'll remove Spotlight. Screen share, keynote, share, and play. I just want to... I always get confused because this bar is there. Whoops. And you guys don't see that bar, right? That's at the top of these images. I can't move my mouse. I hope you don't see that bar. <laughs> I want to be able to move the bar and I can't. Well, here I can move it. I'll just put it at the bottom. I can't see my mouse, but I can see this. So I'm Ron Clifford, a professional photographer and I take portraits of people, and I take portraits of nature, and I help others to do the same. Um, I always uh, love this. The great masters of imagination don't make things out of thin air. They draw our attention to what's right before our eyes. And with their help, we see it not as commonplace 
but as magnificent and not as time-worn, but as timeless. And everyone, every creative person, but we're talking about photographers today, does this from the day they first start. And uh, as far as signature or style goes, I'm going to argue that people have a style or a vision from the day they begin. Uh, and so to take a picture of what, this is what I talk about with, and this is, goes for portraits as well as uh, nature or food photography or anything you take a photograph, dance photography like this, so you do a lot of, uh, to take a picture of what someone looks like is common. We can all do that. We can just pick up our phone and click it. But to take a picture of who they are is masterful. And that goes for whatever the subject is, whether it's portraiture of people or nature or dance or automobile. It doesn't matter what it is. So this is an early picture I took. Toronto Zoo, a couple of polar bears. It's pretty impressive, I think. What do you guys think? A little four by six picture. Uh, when I first picked up the camera as a teenager. Um, and no, it, it's not a great picture. But it, interestingly, what I noticed about it, and keep this in mind, there's water and there's action. Keep those two things in mind. Here's a picture. Uh, I was dating this girl in high school and after high school. And this is Trish. And I love, I love dramatic lighting. What I noticed right away is I was just playing with some really cheap lights. Like this was like so cheap. There was two lights. There was one in front, one behind. You can see it over her shoulder. I took a field trip, this grade 10 photography class to Edwards Gardens in Toronto. And this was one of the first pictures I took with a 35 millimeter camera. And I just loved the light, the dramatic light. So keep that in mind, dramatic light, action. As I, my career moved into my 20s, I started to do a lot of weddings. And I, this is pretty dated. Uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty typical of how I shot almost always at weddings with flash supplementing natural light. That was 90% of the way I shot that kind of work. But I would experiment. I would always experiment like fires. Here's an example. This was done uh, back in the day. This would have been a 30 second exposure on Kodachrome 64 or something. I don't know what it was, but it, it was, we never saw the result until they came back from the lab. None of what you just saw did I see the result of until it came back from the lab. And we move on to today, and uh, my portraits and my wildlife have some common themes, and we'll just go through them. Remember I said I liked action? And you see in my portraits action, and I like water. So you see action and water. And these are today portraits, action and water. And even when I'm shooting wildlife, there's, there's a snowstorm, which is kind of action, and there's water. On a ship, there's action and water. Taking pictures of penguins, there's action and water. And dramatic light, of course. Oh, my shadow. He's my shadow. He's sitting around here somewhere out of the way. But uh, action and water. And, and, you know, you'll first see this picture, and it takes a while to figure out what he's doing. He's running through water. But even when there's not water, there's frozen water and there's action. And so I just want to point out, we'll go back to one of those first images you saw, that um, that looks kind of like that. <laughs> anyway, that's my short presentation. What I want to emphasize with that here, I'm going to spotlight myself one more time, is from the time I first started photographing to today, there are themes in my work that I didn't see then that I only see looking back. And I shot a lot in and around water. I love to capture action in water movement or snow movement or wildlife movement or people movement or even splashing water off a person. And so those were themes that informed the way I love to shoot today. And while not all my work looks like that, a lot of it has to do with dramatic lighting and could do with action or water. And so even when I'm photographing portraits in nature, it's often dramatic lighting or dramatic expression or dramatic images. So I'd like to, to, to move along. And, and uh, I think um, 
I'm going to pick on people. I'm going to start with Richard. I'm going to spotlight you, Richard. If you can do uh, just, uh, I'm going to spotlight you and just ask you, uh, as you answer this question, walk through your images and talk about that. Is there a connection before and after? What was instrumental in accelerating, like in the last couple of years, you, like, I'll, I'll talk about the ramp for a second. Just before I spotlight you, I'm going to, I'm going to replace your spotlight with me for a second. I just want you to answer the question, there's a ramp, right? In the beginning, the ramp goes like this, and then it peters off. Last couple of years, your changes have been less monumental and more incremental. And that's the natural progression of achieving mastery. I say this weird saying that mastery is boredom. And that is when you get to a level, the changes are farther apart and less obvious. But as you apply yourself, they make a difference. So, Richard, tell us a little bit about that. I'm going to spotlight you and uh, then do your screen share. Oh, do my screen share? Okay. So, I'm 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 screen sharing uh, an image that I took. Uh, I was doing film and I was shooting four by five film, and this is a number of years ago. And the reason I picked this image and then the other part of this image is this. These are identically the same places five years apart. Wow. Same subject. Wow. So I've grown a lot in that um, I don't try to capture everything anymore. And I've also, I've also branched out into what I call intimate landscapes, which is a really great way for me to shoot because I love being in the environments that I'm in. So I'll do the, the wide view, and then I'll go in and start doing uh, intimate landscapes. And it gives me the opportunity to shoot one place for a whole day, or maybe a week, uh, whatever I decide. So I like that aspect of it. Yeah. Let me ask and you a then, question as you explain that, Richard. Um, you said maybe a week. Do you find that, like I find that, but do you find the longer you spend, the more you see the real character of your landscape? Like, do you need time? Does it need to steep? I do. And and that's my the way I shoot, too. Even if I'm only out for a day, I'll stay there a couple hours in one place just to, to get the energy of the place. Mm -hmm. That's important to me because yeah. it's more than just shooting. It's a connection. Yeah. So show us the next image again. And, and, oh, and you mean you want to see the, the before one more time? Yeah. Um, right here you can use your arrows probably i'm not sure yeah are you there yeah yeah we're still yeah. here yes. same thing it's the sitting hen in um valley of the gods what a difference yeah you... so it kind of gives you an idea of what you know five years apart now this was um uh, the original was 2014 this is 2019 yeah. So I've even I've changed a little bit, but not much. Mm -hmm. And and the problem that I have is uh, I don't think of myself as having a style. I just look at because I'm the same person that I was back then, and I'm of the opinion that when you pick up the camera, who you are comes through the lens. Well, that's true. Yeah, but isn't that style like we we often hear about style, but isn't that style? Wouldn't you think it, it is? Was? Instead of like yes. a, you know, a, a preset or a gradient, those things aren't styles, right? The style comes from the, like when I see your work come through the stream, I say that looks like Richard's work, and and almost certainly it is. I don't. The way I process, I I process differently than probably most people, and yeah. that actually build an image. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, I take it from the ground up, and I try to make it match my vision. The mm -hmm. vision for me has been the instrumental thing that's changed everything. Yeah. And then going back to my other early work here, Intimate Landscape. This yeah. is Mono Lake um, um, when it was freezing. I was in the middle of an ice storm when this happened. So as you can see, I you know, th here again, this is film. I didn't get into uh, digital probably till, well, till Nikon 8, 850 came along. 
or eight wow. thirty. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember that. It didn't, I, I, was, I was spoiled um, because I have half a gigabyte of information on this frame, and mm. then here's here's another one of a landscape, but it's it's one of my earlier uh, earlier stuff that I really like. But at the same time, it lacks depth. It lacks a lot of the things that I take for granted now. Yeah, this is this is more like work when I, I first met you compared to what you're producing now. Your ability to create depth and capture unique light has changed. Like you're you would sit on this and say, I think there's an image here today. And I, I think you would agree you would spend time or come back at a different time when the light was more dramatic and or you would right. be able to capture more more color or more depth. And your processing right. has very really matured over the years too. I mean, you would process this image differently today than you would have when you first did it. Right, exactly. So going back to the original one, this has a, a you know the color saturation is naturally there. It's a landscape. So, yeah. but here again, I I yeah. I have depth, and that's I really strive to do that. Mm -hmm. Here's here's another intimate landscape that I shot last year. So mm -hmm. things are changing. I mean, yeah, I like intimate landscapes. And what I found with 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 shooting landscapes is, if you look at a landscape, there's a reason that you find it uh, appealing. And if mm -hmm. you look long enough, you'll find it in the image. And then here's more typically what I shoot in landscape now. I, I don't do as many panels as I used to, although I will if the particular environment is, uh, um, you know, if it's something advantageous. Yeah. I go for the, the meat, as it were. And then my last one, this is another l intimate landscape. I'm really getting into, I like the tones, the colors, and as you'll, you'll notice, things are starting to become a little bit more muted because... I use complementary colors now, something I've learned uh, recently within the last yeah. couple of years, so that you don't have to have saturation. It works. They work off of each other. But then again, this is a, um, um, a far different photo in that it's more of a an artistic rendition of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So my style is changing, but there's two different types of photos that I shoot landscape and intimate landscapes so <clears throat> that's kind of the before and after thing yeah well thanks richard thanks for for sharing that and just pop out a screen share and uh pop. yeah and what i was just going to say is um um what i noticed about your work is a lot of people go through this oversaturation phase like you start learning and then you you find that saturation dial and then your work looks pretty gaudy for a you know a few few weeks or a couple of years <laughs> and then you start to mature in the subtlety and, and your work demonstrates you really gravitate toward those beautiful muted compliments now and it it speaks volumes in your work you have a really subtle hand all right i'm going to kind of move along the top i i i'd, I'd love to hear from john now um, if i could you can. Great. So if you can do a screen share, we'll see your work. Uh, John, you have a unique share. You have a unique situation where you live in Texas that you have a nature preserve that you work with. So I'm sure that's going to come up in the discussion. Uh, I began this journey of photography when I turned 70. So I'm a little bit different than, than most late starter, late bloomer. Um, why did I get into it? Um, Quite frankly, I felt getting older, I wanted something that uh, uh, I could do for a long, long time uh, and evolve with it. And my wife is a great painter. She does, uh, and she's hugely creative and has a wonderful eye for color and color theory. And I never knew that I could do that and I never knew that I could be creative so I took a dab in it. I started in the Arcanum with with a 
guy named Rogers. And then a year later, I ended up with Ron for a couple of years. And I remember halfway through my ses sessions with Ron, I think the second year, uh, there was one session where I just asked the question, what the heck is my style? Yeah. And Ron said, you'll know it. Um, this is an example of, of early. This was done 2017, early 2017. It was uh, uh, the Badlands of South Dakota. One thing that's fairly prevalent of my style that I began to recognize was the use of light up here in the in the upper uh, right corner uh, is the brightest part of this image. And that's where I wanted the, the light and you could see the fire below. That's what grabbed my attention. But you have this wonderful sky and then you have this complexity of the badlands below it. Um, so that began the style. Um, this is uh, one that was done in Vancouver Island. Uh, I'm a landscape guy. I always have been a landscape guy. Um, and again, here's the sun rise that grabs your attention. The thing that's prevalent that was brought up by Ron and Richard, um, these colors are, are saturated. You know, if you look at that, the sky yeah. is kind of saturated. The uh, green uh, ground cover is saturated. This is saturated. But the, comp the, the tendency to have the viewer look at the, the brightest spot of the, of the uh, photograph was, well, that became sort of a, a focus as well as the framing. If you look at the framing, you've got these rocks and this rock and that rock, and it's all pointing towards, towards that. Yeah. So I had the framing. Then I had this one. Um, this was an early attempt. Actually, I took this photo in bright daylight at probably noon or one o'clock. And what I wanted to experiment was, can I change the time of day of this image? And it took a lot for me to do this. Mm -hmm. But I wanted something at sunset. And this was a green emerald pool. But you'll notice that you've got a lot of saturation. It looks almost kind of unnatural. Um, but that was my style. I like the framing. This is what captures everybody's eye, this pool. And then you sort of wandered. There was another thing that I didn't realize then that I do now was complexity. Um, there's a lot of texture. Um, there's a lot of form. Mm -hmm. um, and then I didn't quite get into contrast then, but I, I do now. Um, the thing that taught me a little bit about tone was this one. Oh, I remember um, doing this one. The, with you. Yeah. This early 2018 uh, trip to um, the um, Great Sand Dunes National Park in Southern Colorado. This one. Uh, took me a long time and many iterations. The, the brightest part of this image is right here in the lower lower right. But the, the total values in this thing, it took me a long time to bring them out. But I found out that you could do that. You could do near blacks, you could do near whites, you could do all kinds of things. And texture was another thing. Um, so that's, that's what happened. And then um, I got involved in producing a book, which we just signed a contract on with Texas A&M uh, University Press. We printed this year. And it's on how the uh, lands in the hill country of Texas uh, are being preserved. And what changed my style? Well, number one was... Um, I found out what woodlands photography was. And I had a friend, John Dunkel, who used to be a member of this, referred me to another artist. And I recommend this highly. I mean, looking at what others do gives you such insights. Yeah. Uh, I looked at Neil Burnell. I looked at Simon Baxter. I looked at Charlie Kramer, uh, who took a course from Charlie. Uh, Ming Tyne, uh, Alex Noriega. Um, Joshua Snow, to name a few. But looking at those gave me an appreciation 
of what my style is now. This is an example of a fairly read this is about a year ago. But what I found was I paid attention to color contrast, to tone, to luminosity, uh, and I kept complexity. So you notice yeah. that there's really, I went from saturation to vibrance. Yeah. And that was very important to me. You've got complementary colors with the yellow to the blue, and that's where it grabs somebody's attention. You looked at composition, here's the framing of the thing. But the viewer gets to look around this thing, and there's so much in it. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it's very simple because they go right here. So I, I, I found that that was one thing. The edit process was another so that I really had to get to know software. Now, some people do everything in a program called Lightroom. And in the beginning, I did all my editing in Lightroom, every bit. Now I use probably consistently five different programs. Yeah. Uh, and I know what they can do. And I experiment with them. So I go from that to a very stark black and white taken in Gunnison, Colorado, uh, Hartman's Rocks. But the, it was a sky replacement. But I wanted something that was stark, unreal, um, almost uh, mystical. And these rocks sort of gave that, that, that feeling to it with a lot of total contrast. Compared to this, which was done this recent spring, where the first thing that grabbed my attention was this yellow bush. And it was such a pastoral scene. And the colors are all muted, but you look at contrast for depth. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the different colors um, compared to this, which was fog in South Texas and you have the leading line of composition that takes you into a very mystical, um, serene scene um, that's not very bright. It's, it's almost uh, very neutral to dark. And then to this, which is very recent, which is totally different, which is almost uh, experimenting with uh, 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 high processing, where you still have the light to guide your eyes, the color and the path, which gives you a framing thing. And then finally, to this. Mm -hmm. And this was about a week ago. This one I find incredible. Um, it was a picture to edit this. I, I added a sepia overtone uh, to it that kept the fog in the background. Mm -hmm. The framing is here, but your eye just goes right here to to these uh, mossy limbs. But again, complexity and light. And if I was going to say one thing to anybody who develops a style, it's uh, kind of like what Richard said. I'll say it differently. Before you press the store, uh, press the shutter button. Sort of envision a story. What what's going to be the story? Yeah. Do you think you got one in the picture? It's like the vision that Richard talked about. And then press the shutter. And I find I get maybe one out of 10 pictures that I've got a great story. So that's it. Thank you, John. Um, powerful. What we see with Richard and with yourself, both being landscape photographers, is how your, your hand at editing is, um, your hand is now subtle, but you have a great deal of control about how you want the image to be seen by the viewer. Whereas when you were first starting, you would take a picture and kind of work with what was there. You wouldn't push or pull too hard, except for a little bit of contrast and saturation. Uh, you've learned to masterfully handle not just value the light to darken the scene uh, you've mastered having good foreground in that middle ground to background that path into the picture um, but you understand that the subtleties of color what i noticed about your work john lately is 
is you're simplifying the color palette. Like you said on that last one, by applying a sepia uh, tone to it, it, it unifies the color palette. And uh, yeah, really mature work. Really, really great to see the progression. Um, you know what? I think I'm going to pick on Amanda now. Amanda, go ahead and do your screen share. And... So. Looks good. I know when you had reached out, it's like looking about like the three old photos and I'm looking through some of my older stuff and I have to look back and cringe at some of my old stuff. Um, we all look back so and cringe, don't worry. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so my top three probably cringiest photos. Um, I think I look back now compared to probably like seven, eight years ago, and it's compared to now, I probably would have revisited all these places again if I could. Yeah. Um, and go back again but, and just show us some. Um... Just go back, uh, sorry, just, just back us up and let us see them three one more time, these earlier images of yours. Are you able to, uh, yeah, I like that. And the reason I wanna do that is because when you get to your new work, I wanna, I wanna point out that you still had a, a vision. You still had a bit of style. You didn't have as much understanding about cameras or processing or exposure, but you were seeing something. Something was already starting. So go ahead. All right. So there's this is the new stuff. Um, I'll probably within the last like few months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so go back to that first newer one. Yeah. So what I want to point out, it, it, you've got the light coming in from the windows. What you saw in the first picture, we get to see the maturity of style happen because you saw a light streaming through a window. You saw an abandoned building. You saw in that first image we saw, you saw all the things you see here, except now you understand how to expose the image. You understand your, like, even simple things like not having a tilt on your camera, getting your lines leveled up. I mean, all these subtle things. And then your, your color palette. Again, this idea of a unified color palette with these beautiful blue grays with these light yellow to orange complements in this simplified palette. What a beautiful piece of work. And it's, it just tells a story. Instead of being a picture of a building in an old building, it's a story. We want to know what happened in this room. And so I just want to point out to the viewer, Amanda, that that the evidence of a style was there previously. But now, look at the maturity of the images you're producing. So go to the next um, newest image. And in this one, I mean, immediately, and I, I don't mean to, to kind of uh, couch critique, but how we're drawn in from the angles at the lower right and left corner into the image, and then we look in the foreground and immediately we go back and back and back and back along that corridor. Beautiful placement. Again, your, your parallels and your horizontals, your levels and plums are, are in place. You're simplified. It's not a black and white image at all. It's a color image, but it's got that beautiful simplified color palette that lends itself to these abandoned scapes. Wow. I, I mean... Yeah, I, I just get blown away by all your work, but Amanda, your the change in your style was so dramatic. And let's get to that last one. And that one there. And you see that even though this is outside, the language is the same. See those beautiful leading lines, the low camera angle, the the good architectural plums and levels, and then that that unified color palette that's not too crazy. Oh, it just, just speaks volumes. Is there one particular thing or piece of advice or, or thing that happened along your journey that, uh, that got you like from there to here? Or there, you had to, you know, 
say, well, if there was one piece of advice, it would be. Um, I know uh, I've been going out like crazy either every weekend or every other weekend, and which is why I probably accelerated a lot when I was still in the arcade room, mm -hmm. um, because I had so much stuff to weed through, but is not to be afraid to take different shots, like from what you normally do, because especially with, I'll take, you know, the Grand Canyon, everyone and their mother has been there, but you don't want to have, you see pretty much the same exact same shots most of the time coming from folks at visit. So it's like, look at the room, the area, the landscape and see kind of like the bigger picture of what mm -hmm. other stuff that you can be able to see within the same confines of the area and yeah. have fun with it. Don't stress yourself out about it. Yeah. You know, Amanda, um, you, you said two of the super key things. And the one was sh keep shooting, shoot a lot. Um, you need to shoot a lot. Your style doesn't mature just by thinking about it. Your style matures by doing the work. I'm a bit of a bear on this topic. I'm just going to ask you to stop screen share. Is that? Do you have any more to share, or can I kind of nope. rant? On? That that is it. I'm stopping okay. screen sharing. Okay, then I'm going to I'm going to rant for a second here. Uh, Amanda brought up a really good point, and I want to cover it before we get to this. Um, a friend of mine is a painter. And paintings take a long time. And we were both in art school together when we were younger. And uh, as I watched his career grow, I shifted to photography. It's part of a longer story for another day. But I shifted from painting to photography. Probably part of the reason I love dramatic light is, is in, in the way I look at things as an artist first that became a photo artist, a photographer. He said to me, Ron, your first 500 paintings are the worst, so you better get busy. <laughs> now, if we translate that to photography, where it, all it takes is this to take a picture instead of three or four hours or five hours or 10 hours, how many pictures do we have to take? Oh, let's see. Sorry, I'm just going to mute for one second. I can always clip that out. The great thing about not being live is I can clip out, right? And so I'm just going to do a, a signal for that. I'll just wait for him to get into the studio. Probably just got home from an 18 hour shift or something. Okay. So Amanda, yeah, I, I just want to point out that we need to shoot a lot. We need to make our mistakes. And instead of being hard on ourselves, let's have some fun while we're at it. I think you made two very critical points about how we grow as creatives. Vesa. Can I, can I say one thing? Yeah, please, John. Can I say one thing before? Yeah. Just, and I know Vesa's work will illustrate it also in spades, but Amanda does it in an unreal manner, and Richards does too with his intimate landscapes. And that's the introduction of emotion. Mm -hmm. um, when we see something and we present something, I think every one of us attaches an emotion to the story, uh, either through the verbiage we add when we, we post it to the title of the image itself or in our conversation about it. So I think that's equally important. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And what we've seen with the images. When we see the befores, we see just pictures. Somebody held up a camera and took a picture, and they didn't give it a lot of consideration about emotional connection, story. You know, what do we want the viewer to see? We just liked what we saw, and we took a picture. Whereas what we're seeing from everyone so far is the transition from capturing a picture to creating an image. And it, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see. Vesa. Hey there. Yes. 
you're you're the farthest away. You're in a different time zone altogether. Um, yeah. yeah, that's right. Although we're still in today, so that's I think. Yeah, we're... no, it's not too late yet. So yes, let's. Uh, before I start the screen share, I'll yeah. grab this. I have this print here that you'll see in my presentation. But anyway, I'll just show it. It's yeah. it's always here <laughs> because it's an important print. But uh, yeah. let's start. All right. So yeah, my name is uh, Vesaloika. So I'm from Finland and uh, let's see how I get forward. There we go. Here's the print that, that I showed you. And this is pretty much um, uh, the first roll of film that I, I shot. And this is one of the frames. Um, I was probably, I have to actually ask my sister who's much older than me, she gave me the camera and said that finish this roll of film and I had never shot anything <laughs> with the camera. And I was probably like 13 or something like that. And um, and I, I shot a bunch of pictures around the house and in the backyard. And, and then she was studying photography and she made a print out of it. Uh, and this is the print of, of, of the frame. And this has always stuck stuck with me and also the kind of the thrill of you know when I, I I got the camera and I started shooting I was like oh this is so much fun and that was kind of the uh, start of the whole journey which has now gone about 40 years so uh, so then we jump into when I'm about uh, 17 18 years old I was shooting a lot of slide film and this is actually a slide that I a few years back turned into a black and white digital image. But this kind of shows the um, what I was doing at the time and I was experimenting shooting at night and you know doing different things and doing long long exposures and try just trying different stuff. And then we kind of jump way forward into 2013 and uh, this is in New York, in Brooklyn, and I hadn't really uh, photographed a lot of people before this. And then I started, uh, I, I got this uh, um, grant to go to New York and stay there a, a couple of weeks and, and photograph dancers. And I was really like, I didn't know what I was supposed to do really. But then I met these dancers and they just said that, well, we'll just dance on the street and you take photos. And, and this is the very first uh, um, uh, 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 project that we did together. And it just took like, you know, 30 minutes. And I then I realized like, this is something that that's really, I could, I could kind of repeat this idea of uh, part accidental and part plan type of uh, experimentation with people and and I started traveling to different cities in the world and 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 taking pictures so I'll, I'll show this before the other one this was in Shanghai I, I did the same thing in in, in China I w went there and asked asked for dancers to to um, basically improvise dances with me and I was looking for uh, um, kind of interesting backgrounds and I'm an architect by training and I, I was looking at the architecture and trying to kind of combine the people and the architecture but obviously the choreography and the dancers did what they wanted to do and they were you know expressing their um, uh, uh, kind of style so I, I, I wasn't like teaching them how to dance but I was trying to grab grab this uh combination and then this was during the arcanum years which i was part of where i did a double exposure and i guess what this to me really showed like you could you could just take pictures of anything and make it interesting uh in a sense that it doesn't the subject matter is important but I mean, if you if you're just passionate about something, you don't really have to think about what what is the photograph about. Just 
make it interesting. And that's usually uh, enough for people to, to, to make it interesting. And, and so this kind of experimentation and, and uh, combination of uh, just shapes is really at the heart of heart of my photography. Even though I, I like to photograph also people and uh, and here here here's a nature macro photography which I'm very fond of, especially during summertime and doing these really small small scale uh, landscapes in a sense. Where I'm also interested in the flow of the image, just like the dancers. Uh, are flowing <laughs> through the through the frame. Uh, here's another other uh, dance photo, but this is actually a print, as you can see. I printed this on a on a um, uh, on a paper, and I'm very fond of printing my work, and and also experimenting, and going back to your catalog and and printing something that you're already photograph five years ago, but they're making a new new print out of it. And 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 this image is kind of shows the um what I'm interested in the uh, in this uh dance photography project is this accident accidents happen and good accidents happen. And here the 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 dancer, my actual subject is on the right, but there was just a person walking through on the on the left and and somehow it became part of the story, which later and, and nowadays I also do video and film. And, and this seems like a, is part of the film. And I like that idea that the, the picture is just, you know, one moment, but something happened before the picture and something happens after. And you kind of, this uh, type of photograph jumps in the middle of the story, like we we talked earlier about the trying to make a story. So this is kind of in a similar similar line with that. And here's just a photograph of my studio uh, uh -huh. and showing like when I'm do doing prints and stuff, uh, experimenting, and I have tons of prints that I never shown any anybody but I also, also <laughs> sell a lot of prints but you it kind of goes back to the idea that you have to shoot a lot to get something good and same thing with printing you have to print a lot to get <laughs> get good prints so that's kind of my 40 years of photography in five minutes <laughs> uh, yeah I know it's it's hard to condense but uh, condensing is is powerful you know, exactly yeah timeline yeah so if you can uh you can turn your camera back on, and we'll we'll get back to it. And what I, what I wanted to, to notice with you was, you know, that image of the multiple exposure is like it's like full circle. That image of the bike and it has the spokes and it's black and white, you know. Uh, yeah. And then we see this this piece of art. Like it, a, anyone who looks at it, you know, it's like, wow, this is really interesting. It, it has all the aspects of it. It has all tone and. And a little bit of curiosity. You don't immediately know what you're looking at. And so yeah, it's yeah. incredible uh, and incredibly playful. The idea that we, and, and I'm terrible at this. I'm, I'm absolutely awful at this uh, idea that um, I can be more playful. I can let, I can just let it go. I can shoot without the expectation of perfection. Oh, that mm -hmm. plagues so badly. I, I really have this need to be perfectly sharp, you know, to have the right exposure, to not blow out, to, and and that's the the my analytical nature. But the more I learn to let go, the happier I am with the results. And so, yeah, th thanks for sharing that. So now, yeah, I think it's we'll always a contradiction of this control and out of control, and that's yeah. exactly like with dancers, you can't control them really. But you you want to control part of it, and that's uh, that's sometimes hard, and but sometimes that creates the greatest pictures. Yeah, I'm going to go into the to gallery mode for a sec. I'm not sure how that records, but we'll just go do that anyway. Just to sum everything up, I just want to kind of put an umbrella on this. Thank you all for for being here, uh, Vesa. What I noticed about your work, 
especially that last one, just it just had so much impact, so much potential story we were talking about. It doesn't, it's not just a picture, there's a story. And I say that, you know, chance favors the prepared mind is, is a, a saying. And I say, so I altered it to say chance favors the prepared photographer. And that's so true in all the, the work that we see, but in that work where the, the person walks into the, the scene and, and finishes the story or creates a new story, it still has all those elements that you like in your work, the texture, the pattern, your beautiful work with black and white tone, these extremes, this, uh, you know, uh, this push and pull of extremes within the image. And the other thing I, I just wanted to, to mention was how hard it is to communicate movement in a still image. And so what you've done from the beginning of your, your work to now is you've learned how to um, infuse your still work with motion. There's a sense of yeah. tension. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, very well done. So we've kind of heard some high-level stuff, but just in, in parting thoughts, we're each going to take a crack at this. That, you know, just uh, if you, you've given some advice, you can repeat it again or you can give a new piece What's the one thing you would say to the person developing that's frustrated developing their style? What's here's a person, they're frustrated, they're they're pushing, they want to break through. What's your advice? John, go ahead. I've always been big at uh, as you've mentioned, what's what's the main character? Who are the supporting ones? Uh, how do you how do you emphasize that? Um, I tend to do it with, with light and composition and contrast. Um, but I think understanding um, your your own mind and how it focuses on something is very, very important. Uh, we all see things differently. It's it, As Richard said, the vision, envisioning what it can be is to me incredibly important yeah developing the idea to <clears throat> stop just taking a picture and start thinking through what you want people to experience when they see your picture amanda what about you what's uh you gave us some great advice maybe it's the same maybe you have <clears throat> one extra piece. what do you think it comes to editing it's okay to want to learn, try new, try new techniques, but if you're getting frustrated, it's okay to step back for a few minutes and kind of see which direction you want to go to. And sometimes it, having taking that like two second or five minute break, and then taking uh, another look at the image will sometimes really help you out on trying to convey that image uh the what you want to say with your image while trying to edit it after in post-production that's really good advice and, and I, I think that would lead to i'm gonna i'm gonna pick on richard in a second because i think that would lead into what richard might say about the idea that you gotta you gotta step away you gotta take time you, you, it has to percolate i use the word percolate but richard what would you say what what's a high level piece of advice for the person that's hitting the wall and, and wants to get to the next level. For one thing, don't worry about your vision so much. Um, develop and change and uh, chase your vision. When you take an image, so often as we grow older, when we were younger, we had visions, but then they were, they were decimated. I call it through our productive years. And, um, the vision is who you are. If you shoot your vision, you will develop your style. You might not recognize it. I don't recognize it. I don't recognize uh, recognize my vision because I think it's always been the same. It's just that I've had refinement. Uh, uh, I've had refinements on how I can present it so that other people can see it. And uh, like my granddaughter told me, he says, "Grandpa, you really Tinker Bell like this stuff." And I and I said, yeah, I do. And if you can get your emotion, uh, for me, uh, landscape shooting is an emotional experience. 
it uh, it does overcome me, especially when I'm there before sunlight, and I can actually feel the warmth uh, and the wind from the sun heating up the globe. I mean, it's you're standing on ground, hollowed ground, because every day is a new day, and every day is different. Wow! Yeah, great advice, Richard. Yes. Your parting. I, I'd say that uh, uh, remember to print your work and and kind of put those prints. You know, whether it's four by sixes or bigger ones or smaller ones, whatever. But put them on your on on your wall or somewhere on your fridge or somewhere where you see them from day to day and that's part of the percolating and you know because you see it different like if i do you shoot and you print and then you wait a month and you look at it again you see it differently like you saw it month before so that's a good way to kind of see uh back back in time basically and and think about think about your not necessarily necessarily your style but how you see it differently in, in, in different uh, time. Yeah. So that's my advice. Keep printing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's advice I need to take as soon as I get a printer. Although I do have, um, I do have prints in my studio. I love to see work printed. I wish I had space to print all kinds of work. Just put it everywhere. So yeah. uh, again, I'd like to thank you, uh, panel, for coming and talking about photography and style and voice and i'm just gonna take a bit of time to summarize because i as a mentor i've witnessed people go from avid photographer you know camera clicker getting new lenses you know really copying styles or using sliders and dials and trying to trying to create their best work but in the beginning you don't know what you don't know. And so by applying yourself as the, as the, 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 the group here is shared, John, Richard, Amanda, and uh, Vissa and myself, you have to do the work. You have to get your hands dirty. You have to risk not doing good work before you do good work. And so I'm going to leave you with two pieces of advice. Number one. Don't sweat it if you're not there yet, because you're never there yet. Every time you approach a goal, and this is the pebble thing, Richard will love this one. You can throw a pebble into water and you move toward it. You know, in the rings, you move toward the pebble, the rings in the water. And as you move toward that goal, you're just about there. Throw another pebble move toward that goal. You're never there. You're always getting there. You know, it's cliche, but it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. So get your camera out, take pictures, make mistakes, create disaster pieces. That leads to masterpieces. And finally, look in the rearview mirror. Today, when I pulled out my portfolio that had work from high school and had other work, like, I have one back here. You can kind of see this big 30 by 30 picture of, a, of a, and another one there of a, a, a wedding. And even then I was using a flash to fill the light in, in incandescent light. Look back at your work. Look in the rear view mirror. See what you did. And see where you're at. Because if you're feeling bad about where you're at, there's a good chance if you look in the rear view mirror, you'll realize how far you've already come. And so that's my advice to you. As a mentor, somebody who works with creative people and watches their journey, not just over a period of a week or a month, but how it unfolds over a few years. And how as they challenge themselves, as they seek out inspiration, I'm definitely not going to take credit for where each of these people are. I'm a, a stepping stone on their journey as a mentor. As you heard John, and, and, and he had different influences. And if we asked each person in the room, I am not their influence. I'm just somebody that helps adjust the course, helps identify areas that need some work as they do the hard work every day of creating. 
So that's really it in a nutshell. I want to thank the group. I'm going to go back to my gallery view for everyone. I want to thank the group for being here and uh, sharing their perspective about what it means to develop a signature style. And that in the end, we all had it at the beginning. We saw it. We just saw it here, all of us. And we've matured that style by doing the work, seeking inspiration, and applying ourselves uh, to getting better every day. And uh, so that's my encouragement to you. Thanks for helping me out, everyone. You can unmute and we'll all say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. See you Thank in you. the next one.